We are ready for what's identified as lecture number two in your notebooks there, lecture number two, which is identified as the heart of a Christ-centered message. The goal of the lesson, as it's stated here, is to understand the unifying principle that binds all Scripture together. Now, to underscore for you why I think this is so important, let me tell you about uh, an experience in, in my hometown. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri is uh, about the size of Kuala Lumpur. I think you're a little larger. You're, you're 4 million metropolitan area, something like that. We're about 3 million in St. Louis. And uh, like you, we have some major highways that go down into the city. And we have a few major radio stations. One of the uh, major radio stations is a, is a national broadcast station, so it can reach all the way across the country. And uh, that particular station, early in the morning, has a, a radio show that lasts only for a few minutes, and the radio show is called The Thought for the Day. The Thought for the Day. And uh, in this program, there is a man who speaks with a lot of solemnity and, and uh, begins to instruct people, often with verses from the Bible. And he will say things like... Um, Those of you who are employees who are on your way to work today, at work, you should not simply work as unto men. You should work as unto the Lord. It's not just that you should work if you get a fair wage, but even if your boss is not a good boss, if he's harsh, you should work so as to please the Lord and to bring glory to him. Or he might say something like, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Now, in the Bible, the word exasperate is a word that God reserves for himself. It's a word that stands for his just anger at his people when they do not do what his word requires. God can grow exasperated with his children. But Paul the Apostle uses that word to speak to fathers. And Paul says, fathers, do not exasperate your children, which means you should not give your children just cause to be angry with you. Don't be hypocrites. If you live for the Lord in church, live for the Lord in your family as well. Now, in my imagination, as this speaker is giving the thought for the day, I imagine the many Christians that are also driving into town along the major highways of St. Louis, and as the Christians are listening to this radio station, they are doing something while this man, whose name is Richard Evans, while Richard Evans is speaking, Christians are all doing something. What are they doing? They're driving and they're going. They're nodding their heads. You know, you tell them, Richard, you know, <laughs> you know they should listen to the word of God. You tell everybody they should listen to the word of God. In, in many ways, it, it Sounds pretty good. But there are actually a few problems. Uh, The first problem with Richard Evans is that he's dead. He died many years ago. (laughs) This was all recorded, you know. (laughs) And uh, when they recorded it, by the way, they turned up the echo very much, so the reverberates, so it sounds like it's direct from Mount Sinai. You know, fathers do not exact, you know, it's very, it's very impressive. Yeah. But there's actually a more serious problem. The most serious problem is that Richard Evans is not and never was a Christian. He was actually the head. Anybody know the name? He was the head of the Mormon church in the United States. Now, if you were to listen to those messages of Richard Evans, day after day after day, I will tell you there is almost never a problem with what he does say. What's the problem? It is with what he does not say. He will say... Be a good employee, be a good father, be a moral person, do good deeds. He gives many good moral lessons. What is the lesson that never appears 
in the words of Richard Evans. The atoning work of Jesus Christ never appears. It sounds very good, but something absolutely vital is missing. And that actually is what separates it from being a Christ-centered message and a message that is the religion of all others in the world. Because it's not a Christ-centered message, it is a human-centered message. It's what you do to make yourself right with humanity or with God. It's all on you. You just do good things and God will be happy, which is not the message of Christianity. Christianity does not say you just be good and God will be happy. Christianity says when you have done all that you can do, you are still an unworthy servant made right with God by the work of Christ alone. If you begin to get that understanding, it begins to affect how we unfold the message of Scripture as we preach. I want to introduce to you what is the actual main thing that every Scripture addresses. Now you say, well, there's lots of Scriptures about being good, about being a good father, being a good employee, doing good things. That's true. But behind those texts, there is always another principle. And I want to introduce it to you with these letters, the F. C, F, which I will identify as the fallen condition focus. Fallen condition focus. We do not have to guess what essentially every scripture is about. The Bible itself tells us. I mean, for many Christians, of course, John 3.16 is almost the motto verse. But if not John 3.16... Maybe for many evangelicals, another motto verse is 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. You know these words? I was raised on the King James Version, so I'll say it in the King James. All Scripture is what? In, inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be... Now, in the King James, here's the hard word coming. That the man of God might be perfect... Now, that's actually the Greek term artios, that the man of God might be complete. That's the idea. Thoroughly furnished for all good works. All Scripture is inspired by God to complete us. What's its purpose? All Scripture. All Scripture's purpose by doctrine, reproof, correction, is to bring us to completion. Now, there's a necessary implication. If all Scripture is given to complete us, what does that necessarily say about us? We are incomplete. We are incomplete. We are fallen creatures in a fallen condition. We can't fix our own God must provide something to complete us because we are fallen creatures in a fallen world. We cannot fix ourselves. And therefore, the Apostle Paul will say in the verse that's here also, Romans 15, 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime. Now, that's a very broad verse. Whatever was written prior to this. So the Apostle is looking through the whole of the Old Testament Scriptures, right? Whatever was written aforetime was written for our learning that through patience and the comfort of the Scriptures, we might have what? Hope. Everything that was written aforetime was written for us. Why? Because we're fallen creatures in a fallen world. And everything that was written was written for us so that in our incompleteness, we could still have hope. God is doing something that we cannot do for ourselves And all the scriptures are containing that message. Our goal as Christian preachers and teachers is to say, how is God making clear what our hope is if we are these fallen creatures? So as we unfold these things, recognize, I'm still on the first page here, right there in the middle, all scripture has a fallen condition focus. Since everything written in scripture has the purpose of giving us hope, in that fallen condition. 
Now, there are certain implications of this, the implications of the fallen condition focus. It means that as we look at a text, we're not simply saying, what is here, but why is it here? Not simply what is here, but why is it here? The the why of the text, how are we incomplete that required the writing of this text? Here's the information, here's truth. But why is it here? Because we're incomplete. And part of my explaining the text is to not only say what is here, but why is it here? And as we do so, we begin to bring the truths of Scripture to God's people. Now, one way of thinking about this, and I hope you'll forgive me for the analogy here, is we as preachers, because we know that everyone is incomplete, when we look at people, we ought to see Swiss cheese. Is there Swiss cheese in Malaysia? What does Swiss cheese have in it? It has, it has holes. When we look at people, we ought to see Swiss cheese. They're incomplete. They have holes in them. But now think of my obligation as a Christian preacher. I say, oh, you're incomplete. You have some holes in you. Here's what will fill the holes. You just be a better person. You be a better father. You be a better employee. And that's my message today. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. You be so good that your children have no cause to be exasperated with you. Go home, be blessed, be happy. What's the problem? You're a fallen creature. If I am saying that you can fill the hole by your good works, I will assure you, you cannot fill the hole because you're a fallen creature. And the hole that is in you, the incompleteness, has to be filled not by you, but by God. And what that means is, if our preaching is simply moral behavior, here are some good things you should do. It says so right here. It says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. That what we've actually done, we didn't mean to do it, but we actually begin to preach the message of every other religion than Christianity. God isn't happy. You placate God. You be better than someone else. You do the things that will make you okay with God. The trouble is, that is not the Christian message. The every, every other faith will say, here's what you do to fix it. That is not the Christian message. There are implications of this understanding of the fallen condition focus. Number one, until we have determined why a text was written, we do not know what it means. Now, I can say, well, exasperate is a word that God uses to describe his own anger at his children. I've said many true things, right? I've told you what it means, but I haven't told you why it's here. And that means you still don't really know what it means. Until we've determined why a text was written, we do not know what it means, even if we say many true things about it. Number two, therefore, we are not ready to say what a passage means until we have determined why the Holy Spirit included it in Scripture. As I look at the text, I can tell you true things, but until I say, why did the Holy Spirit put this here? Until I've answered that question, I don't really know what the text means, even if I say many true things about it. At the bottom of the page, what will help us think about this is understanding what this fallen condition focus really is. The FCF is the mutual human condition that contemporary believers share with those two or for whom the text was written that requires the grace of the passage. Requires the grace of the passage. All right? We look at people. You got holes in you. There's something wrong. If my message is simply, here's what you do to fix it, I ultimately am ignoring the grace of God, which alone can fix the human condition. So if my message is simply about moral behavior, do better than someone else, or even obey this rule, if that's the exclusive aspect of the message, I've actually preached apart from the grace of God, and while I did not mean to do it, I actually began to preach a human-centered message rather than a message of the gospel. Now I say, but that's what the text says. Well, look at the context. Why is it here? What is God revealing to his people? Page two. 
begins to relate to us not only the problem, but the solution as well. Page two at the top. Recognize, thus far, we've only discussed the negative, the thing that's wrong, the whole, the fallen condition. If all scripture focuses on some aspect of our fallen condition, why does it do so? The answer is clear. It is is to supply the warrant and need for the redemptive elements, the redemptive elements it contains to be applied. Redemptive elements. Thus, just as every scripture echoes our incompleteness, it is in some manner signaling the Savior's work which makes us whole or complete. You see, if we look at a text and we begin to say there is some aspect of humanity's fallenness here, what we're forced to do is say there's got to be a divine solution. Because if I've truly pointed at human fallenness, humanity cannot fix that problem. God has to fix that problem. By identifying why the text was written, I am forced to say how does God fix the problem because it cannot be fixed by human work alone. Our goal, therefore, as readers and teachers of Scripture, is to decipher the signals of the text. For until we do so, we do not truly understand the text. It is possible, after all, to say all the right words and yet send all the wrong signals. Remember Richard Evans? Fathers do not exasperate your children. Were his words right? They actually were. The words were right. You should be a good father. You should not give your children just cause to be. The words are right. The signals are all wrong. Because the signals mean you don't actually need a Christ. You just live well enough, have a good family, and God will be happy. Your salvation depends upon you. God's approval depends upon you. Whereas we didn't really see how the Apostle Paul contextualized the message. Um, Husbands, you are to love your wives as Christ did what? As Christ loved the church. In the same manner, fathers are to love their children. There's a redemptive context. Always it will be there. And as we begin to look at the scriptures, we are saying God is not simply giving a list of moral maxims for us to follow. There is moral instruction, but it's always within the context of a redemptive provision of God whereby His grace enables and motivates us to do the works that God calls us to do. If the grace is not in the picture, Christ is out of the picture, and it becomes a human-centered religion. Now, that puts us under a certain compulsion that may strike you at first as being very difficult. That is, we need to become, as preachers and teachers, Experts at deciphering the redemptive design of every passage. Or else we'll just preach a human-centered religion. How do we actually see those redemptive signals? Now, I'm going to talk to you in image for a little bit, and I'm going to confess to you straight out that uh, this is going to be a little bit caricature. I'm doing it to make a point. And so just accept, if you will, the fact that there are limitations to my examples here, okay? One way that we have all been taught to examine a text is what I call the magnifying glass approach. I take out my magnifying glass and I say, what what does that text mean? And I begin to examine it. I look at the the tense of the verb, (laughs) the case of the noun. Who was Artaxerxes anyway? You know, know, I, I look at all the details. Now, is that a good thing to do? Oh, sure. That's a very good thing to do. It's a good and a necessary thing to do. And this magnifying glass approach is what we typically have thought as being the obligation of systematic theology. I look and I see, where is that term? Where is it used elsewhere? What's the meaning of that word? What's the tense here? And I begin to develop a system of thinking based upon looking at the details of the text. Now, let me say again, that is a good thing to do. That is a necessary thing to do. But it's not the only way of looking at the text. There is another way of looking at the text in which I take out a fisheye lens. Now, some of you photographers, if I put a fisheye lens on my camera, what do I see? 
I see out to the horizons, right? This is a wide angle lens, so I see outward. Another way of looking at the text than the magnifying glass is to look at it through a fisheye lens, which means when I look at the text, I'm looking at what's around it. I'm looking at its context. Where does this fit? Particularly, where does it fit in God's redemptive plan? Yes, it says certain things in its particulars, but it's got a context. What is the reason that every heretic has his verse? He takes his verse what? Out of context. He takes his verse out of context. And basically what I'm asking for us to do is simply keep the verse in context. Now, these things have names. Biblical theology, to fill in the first two blanks there, biblical theology is that discipline of Bible interpretation that emphasizes the overarching themes that unite all of Scripture's particulars. Now, we're still looking at Scripture's particulars, okay? Still using the magnifying glass. But biblical theology is saying what unites them. What are the overarching themes that unite those particulars? Biblical theology is not simply asking what truth does this particular passage reveal, but how is it related to the whole? How is it related to the whole message of Scripture? Now, the importance of this, again, I hope you'll forgive me for, for the analogies. I think on your sheets it says, consider the acorn. But there's not a lot of acorns here. The other night, uh, I was taken... Is Salvendron still here? I was taken to the night market by Salvendron. He was out late that night, but we told his wife it was okay. Um, <laughs> And um, Salvendron bought for, bought for me some jackfruit, all right? Now, inside the jackfruit, there's, there's a stone, there's a seed, right? A fairly large seed. You see where I'm going with this? <laughs> now, let's just imagine that all I had was I had the seed. You know, I had the stone. And I would say, all right, now, now let me tell you about the stone of a jackfruit, okay? It's, it's dark-colored, and it's kind of smooth, and, you know, it's a, a couple of inches long, a few centimeters, you know. And, and uh, you know, you find this in the night market every now and then, and, and, that, and that's, that's what the stone of jackfruit is. Now, I've just told you many true things about the seed. But if that's all I told you in describing the seed was it's dark brown, it's, it's kind of smooth, it's, you know, a, a few centimeters long, I might have told you many true things, but you still would not really understand what that was about. In order to really understand what that seed is about, what do I also have to tell you about? I've got to tell you about the jackfruit. Is it on a tree or a bush? <laughs> I'd have to tell you about the tree, right? At some point, in order to understand the seed, you've got to know what the, what the mature message is about, right? You've got to know what it matures into, or you don't really understand it. All right, I want you to think of another seed. This seed is the commandment. You shall not steal. Now, this is found in the Decalogue. Moses gave this command. This command not only appears in the standards of Moses, this reappears in the writing of Paul. Paul says in at least three books that we should not steal. Stealing's bad. You shouldn't do it, so don't steal. Did I say anything untrue? I didn't say anything untrue. Do you know what the commandment is really about? Now listen. The commandment means that you shall never take anything that is not your own. Not things large, not things small. You shall not even take another man's reputation away from him. If it's not yours, you shall not take it away. Stealing's bad. Don't do it. If I really understand the commandment, what do I understand about myself? You shall never take anything that is not your own. Not big, not little, 
not even another man's reputation. If I really understand the commandment, you shall not steal, what do I understand about myself? I'm a thief. That's what I understand. What do I understand about God? God gave this command, you shall not steal. You shall not take things big. You shall not take things small. You shall not take anything that's not your own. If I really understand the commandment, what do I understand about God? He is holy. God is holy and righteous, and I'm a thief. There's a problem here. There's a problem here I cannot fix. Who fixed it? Paul said the law was our schoolmaster to lead us to what? Christ. Now you say, well, all it said was don't steal. Actually, in its context, its redemptive context, that's not all it said. What it said was, you're a thief and God is holy. And when I understand that, I will begin to say, God is teaching me more than to be a good person. God is teaching me I must be dependent upon Him to solve the problem of my sin. Because as I begin to understand how God has described who He is and who I am, there is a fallen condition I cannot fix and a divine solution must be found. That's why Paul could say the law was our schoolmaster, our pedagogue, to come alongside us and lead us to Christ. Now, the the one who explored this the most fully in the last century was a man named Gerhardus Voss. And in his book, Biblical Theology, he began to explain these redemptive principles that are underlying every biblical text. The first he called the progressive principle. The progressive principle. He said this, Biblical theology is that branch of exegetical theology. Now, you don't know it, but you're just witness to political savvy. Gerhardus Voss was the first professor of biblical theology at Princeton Seminary. Now, there had previously been New Testament theologians, Old Testament theologians, systematic theologians, and now we hired this new young guy, and he's professor of something called biblical theology. Well, I'm not sure I like that. I'm not sure I like him. (laughs) And so Voss says, no, listen, this thing that I'm doing, this biblical theology... It's just a branch of exegetic. You've always exegeted the scriptures, right? You exegeted the New Testament. You exegeted the Old Testament. This is just a branch of exegetical theology. I'm still exegeting the text, but I'm looking at it with a fisheye lens rather than a magnifying glass. So he says, biblical theology is that branch of exegetical theology which deals with the process of the self Revelation of God deposited in the Bible. Revelation is a noun of action relating to divine activity. Revelation is an historically progressive process along series of successive acts. Now, I know a lot of words are going by, but it's, it's really just a simple thought. He is saying God in the Scripture is revealing Himself. But it doesn't happen all at once. It's progressive. And in the simplest terms, we could say, in terms of God's revelation, Paul knows more than Samson. Now, I'm not saying what Samson knew was wrong, but Paul knows more. There's been a progression. And part of understanding biblical theology is that God intends for there to be a progression of understanding as the scriptures unfold. Second principle, the organic principle the organic principle. Voss said the progressive process is organic. Revelation may be in seed form. Remember the jackfruit seed? (laughs) It may be in seed form, which yields later full growth, accounting for diversity, but not true difference. Because the earlier aspects of the truth 
are indispensable for understanding the true meanings of the later forms and vice versa. Now, again, lots of words. How do we say it simply? He's simply saying it's all tied together. It's all tied together. So you understand what happens later because of what happened earlier. At the same moment, you understand more of what happened earlier by how it relates to what came later. Think of it this way. Jesus speaks to Nicodemus. And Jesus says, Even as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, how do you know what that means? Well, you remember what it refers to. The people of Israel are complaining. Oh, no, more manna. And an indicative of the poison coming out of their mouths, God sends venomous vipers among them. And when they are experiencing, as it were, the poison that's like their own words, they begin to call out for help. And God says to Moses, I want you to fashion this serpent of metal and you raise it up on a pole and say to the people, look at it and you'll live. Now, I confess to you, even when I was in Sunday school, I used to think to myself, well, why wouldn't anybody do that? I mean, just look. <laughs> you li- Just look. Why didn't they want to do that? Think of what was on the top of that pole. It wasn't an image of God. It wasn't even an image of Moses, their deliverer. It was an image of their sin. To look at it, I must face my sin. Jesus says to Nicodemus, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, which means you must look to me to live. And in future days, Nicodemus, who sits on the Sanhedrin, that condemns Jesus to death and ultimately at the hands of the Romans, crucifixions, Nicodemus must look at Jesus Thorns on his brow, nails in his hands, the blood streaming from his side. And if Nicodemus sees the bloody, gory mess of Jesus, what does he really see? Nicodemus sees his sin. Even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. But if you will look at it, If you will look and believe this is your sin upon me, you will live. If you will believe this is your sin upon me, you will live. It's organic. I understand what Jesus meant because of how Moses used the brazen serpent. But at the same moment, I understand more about the brazen serpent because of how Jesus used it. They are tied together. They're connected. It's organic. One more principle. Voss says on page three, the three at the top, what he called the redemptive principle. He says, revelation is inseparably linked to the activity of redemption. Let me just stop there for a moment. God is not revealing things for himself for the test later. I I, I want you to know the five attributes of God. No. God's revelation of himself is connected to something. It's connected to what he will do on behalf of his people. So he says revelation is inseparably linked to the activity of redemption. Revelation is the interpretation of redemption. To see revelation properly, we must see it in its redemptive context. The context and content of some revelation may be in seed form. In other words, it may not be a full message of the atonement. Well, let's acknowledge that, right? It may not be fully mature yet. It may just be the seed. 
but it is integrally related to the mature message and is not properly understood or communicated until this relationship is made clear. All right, now that's, that's an amazing statement because it says the book of Judges is not just about Samson and Deborah. You know, it, it, it's not just stories of heroic people. And the, the blessings and the curses in the book of Deuteronomy are not just you know, items of how God dealt with an ancient people. Each of these, while it's revelation, is at the same time connected to a message about redemption. God is saying to the people, you must depend upon me. And he says through the judges, if everyone does what is right in his own eyes, it goes really badly. You have to look away from yourselves. You have to face the consequences of your sin. Why? Because the scriptures are leading forward. They're pointing to something else. So if all we do to people is to say, well, Samson was a good guy when he had long hair, therefore you should have... (laughs) Well, no, that's not exactly what I mean. Um, we, We begin to look for little moral messages in the stories. Rather than saying, what is the function of the story in the redemptive message? And that's got a larger purpose. It's keeping the story in its context, its redemptive context, because all revelation is God saying, I am connecting this so that you will know where it leads in the redemptive message. There at the, uh, just at the conclusion there where it says the acorn lesson. We'll call that the jackfruit lesson. <laughs> in the same sense as trying to explain an acorn without mentioning the oak tree, we cannot properly explain any aspect of revelation, even if we say many true things about it, until we have in some way related it to redemption. Now, we should immediately have questions. Because, but, but, but wait a second, there are vast portions of Scripture in which there is no mention of Jesus. It doesn't say someone is coming to die on the cross. It doesn't mention. There are vast portions of Scripture in which there is no mention of Christ. So we say, all right, well, how can it be redemptive if there is no mention of Christ? Because what will always be apparent is this. How am I seeing humanity's fallenness on display. Something is wrong that they can't fix, and God is underscoring it. There is something wrong that humanity cannot fix without the redemptive work of God. Now, when I was uh, growing up, I grew up in a family with six children, so a lot of children around, and uh, it was an era that instant foods were just kind of coming on the market in America. And uh, there was something that was coming out which was instant chocolate mousse, okay? You, you, you mix, you know, you, the power, you get instant chocolate mousse. Now, listen, my mother is an expert cook, and instant chocolate mousse was not good enough for her family. She was not going to use instant chocolate mousse. You know, you, you had to do the cooking. You have to get everything just the right way. You get it in the bowl. You let it set up. You let it firm, and uh, I can remember one particular meal that, that my mother, you know, after we'd eaten the meal, put the dessert mousse on the table, big bowl. And it became obvious immediately that at some time in the afternoon, one of the six children had gone to the bowl of chocolate mousse and created what we call a thumb lollipop. <laughs> My mother said, who did that? And all six children, as though they were in a church choir, said together, not me. (laughs) Now, my mother is a smart lady. (laughs) So she said to the children, stick out your thumbs. (laughs) And then she took our hands and she began to measure It was my brother, Gordon. (laughs) Because the whole revealed the dimensions of what would fill it. The whole revealed the dimensions of what would fill it. 
If in the scripture I am seeing true human fallenness, I begin to recognize that human works will not fill the hole. God is the only one who can fill the hole. And the scriptures, by showing us human fallenness, are revealing what God must do, ultimately in Christ, but leading us to understand what God must do. There are some key principles being revealed. Let me go to item C on page 3. God's imprinting of our incompleteness in Scripture does not merely show our fallenness. It reveals His nature, His nature and attributes which are necessary to fill us up and make us whole. If fallen humanity cannot fix the problem, then our fallenness begins to reveal what must God provide, His nature, His attributes, which are going to fix the problem. Some key principles in this understanding. The first is the principle of incompleteness. Incompleteness. Because we are fallen, Scripture is not telling us what we can do, excuse me, not telling what we must do to complete ourselves or to make ourselves acceptable to God. For then we would not be truly fallen. Two, the principle of incapacity. The principle of incapacity. No, script, no text in Scripture says what we can do or should do to make ourselves better or more acceptable to God as though we could lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps because the Bible is not a self-help book. Would you agree with that? The Bible is not a self-help book. Now, the reason that's so important to understand is if all I have said in my message is treat your wife better, pray better, be more obedient to your parent, be a better employee, I did not mean to, but I just gave a self-help sermon. You got holes in you. Who fixes that? Well, you do. Because the only message I gave you in my sermon was what you do. I meant to do well. I meant to give you help. But by having a self-help message, I actually damaged you. Because I convinced you that your spiritual status is dependent upon you rather than dependent upon Christ. Three, the principle of integration The principle of integration, meaning this, all the scriptures are about one consistent organic message. They tell us how we must seek Christ, who alone is our Savior and source of strength to do the things that God says must be done. To proclaim these musts, here's what you must do, to proclaim these musts apart from the source that enables their accomplishment is to warp the biblical message because Christ is integral to every passage. I am not saying that every passage mentions Jesus. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that every passage has a redemptive context. Our goal as Christian preachers and teachers is to identify where the text stands in relation to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Where does this text stand in relation to the ministry of Jesus Christ that God is ultimately revealing in His Word? Now, there are some some key texts for us, I hope, that show this isn't just an idle theory or a a new convention, but it's something the Scriptures themselves are saying. Key for a biblical theologian is 1 Corinthians 2.2. I resolved, says Paul, to make nothing known among you but Jesus Christ and what a good guy he was and how you can be almost as good if you'll try really, really, really... Is that what it says? I resolve to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, we really want to start debating Paul, don't we? Say, that's not true. You you talked about Family relationships, you talked about stewardship principles, you talked about worship practices, you talked about discipline in the local church, you talked about lots of other things, Paul. Well, apparently not in his mind. Apparently there was a 
a hub of the wheel. And though it could have spokes going in many directions, the core message was Jesus has made a way for you that you cannot make for yourself. There are implications for that. As you live out in thanksgiving and gratitude a response to what God has done for you in Christ. But the core message is the same. God has provided for you what you cannot provide for yourself. That's why Paul would say in just the preceding chapter, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Would any Jew be upset because Paul said, you should be faithful to your spouse? Any Jew upset by that? You should glorify God in your business practice. Any Jew upset by that? No, what was the problem? You have not been faithful to God. As faithful as you may think you have been, you have failed Him. And you have robbed God by giving the credit for your spiritual status to yourself rather than to Him. That was the stumbling block. That's why they wanted his head. Not because of the moral message, but because of the gospel core that he preached always. It's said by Jesus too. You know these words. Luke 24, 27. This is Christ on the road to Emmaus. And he is described by Luke this way. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained what was said in all the scriptures concerning what? Himself. Now, for a biblical theologian, those alls are all important, right? He explained what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, that that is an amazing interpretive or hermeneutical principle. Jesus just said that all the scriptures are about himself. That means if I explain any text without mention of him in some way, I fail to say the very thing Jesus said it's about. Jesus said it's about him. So if I don't relate it to Christ, I have failed to say the very thing Jesus said it's about. Finally, though we could multiply the examples many times, we see it visually in Matthew 17, the transfiguration. You know this. Who appears on the mount with Jesus? Moses and Elijah. Moses represents what? The law and Elijah? The prophet. Now, it's it's just visually there for the apostles. All the law and all the prophets testify of me, Jesus says. It's all led to this. It's all been about this. He is the culmination. He is where this is led. So he's even demonstrating to us visually what the totality of Scripture has been about. It is that message that is leading us forward into understanding what God will do and accomplish in the ministry of His Son. Now, there are very definitely implications of this. If you look on page 4, it forces us to think about what is truly distinctive about a Christian message. If it's not just moral behavior or moral instruction... What becomes the distinctive mark of truly Christian messages? First, there is present the offense of the cross. Versus the obvious acceptance of moralism that would be perfectly acceptable in a synagogue or mosque. This has always been frightening to me. I mean, it was one of the things when I was being taught this material that that drew me up short and made me really look at my own messages with a different eye than I'd ever looked at before. When a professor said these words, is the sermon that you preach perfectly acceptable in a synagogue or a mosque? Because if it is, there is something radically wrong with it. Christian preaching is distinctive, and what makes it distinctive is not just instruction and moral behavior. It is the message of the atoning work of Jesus Christ apart from which no one can be acceptable to God. So if all I did in a message was I just said, be a better father, no Jew is upset. But our Father in heaven knows that message did not honor him. 
It simply called upon more human behavior to make us right with neighbor or even God. The pervading presence of Christ should be in all we communicate. That's what makes ours Christ-centered messages versus human-centered messages. The pervading presence of Christ in all we communicate makes ours Christ-centered messages versus simply human-centered messages. Now, we are going to be talking about what makes a message Christ-centered for the next day, the two lectures tomorrow. But it may help us for a bit now to actually begin to identify what the wrong path is. What, what's, what's the road to avoid? So I want to talk for a little bit about identifying non-redemptive messages. What, what are messages that truly are not Christ-centered? Item A under Roman numeral 4 says this. The nature of non-redemptive messages. Sermons that are not Christ-centered are inevitably man-centered. And what makes them man-centered is that they are sola bootstrapsa. (laughs) You just pick yourself up by your own bootstraps and you fix the problem. Sola bootstrapsa. Our difficulty is that sometimes we create an image of Christianity that, that doesn't serve us when it comes to thinking redemptively, because we're just thinking about distinguishing ourselves from people who are not living as right as we think they should. And so we create some sort of a spectrum in our mind. And we say, you know, over here is uh, liberalism. And over here is legalism. And we say, you know, balanced Christianity is, is somewhere in the middle, you know. Well, uh, there's a problem with that way of thinking. What does a legalist think will make you right with God? What does a legalist think will make you right with God? The works you do, right? All right? And we will typically put them in some sort of you know, moral category, right? Uh, it will be, um, you know, um, uh, don't go to bad movies. Don't listen to bad music. Don't go with bad girls. You know. Yeah, well, we'll have some sort of list of moral behaviors. In the States, we call this. Does anybody in Malaysia chew tobacco? Is that, is that a practice here? Okay. It's something that's traditional in the States in some cover. And we say, all right, here's a true Christian. Don't drink or smoke or chew or go with the girls that do. <laughs> now, You could actually think, and some do, what makes you a Christian? Well, you're a good person. You don't drink or smoke or chew or go with the girls that do. You're a good person. That must make you a Christian. Now, we recognize in its baldest expression, that's just true legalism, right? That's not faith in Christ. That's just faith in your moral behavior. Now, somewhere else over here is a a, a liberal perspective. Now, if somebody is a true liberal, what do they think will make you right with God? Good works. It's just a different set of good works. What are the good works over here? They are social concerns, usually. Right? Care for the poor. Care for the environment. Right? Fighting racism. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But if you say, this is what makes you right with God, having the right social position or the right social action. What we don't recognize is these are actually the same thing. The the spectrum turns back on itself. It it, it says, all of this, that Christianity is doing good things. And you're made right with God by what you do. What I want you to know is Christianity can't be found on that scale. It's not there at all. Christianity is not based upon your doing something that's going to be make you right with God. Christianity is based on the fact that Christ did everything that was necessary to make you right with God. Your faith is not in what you do. Your faith in what he has 
done is your only hope of salvation. Now, there are implications of that as you live in obedience and gratitude to Him. But your action is not what makes you right with God. His action is what makes you right with God. So somehow trying to find a balance between these things, if that's all we're doing, is not really the Christian message. Now, you begin to think of that as I press you a little bit with these additional marks of non-redemptive messages. Marks of more non-redemptive messages. Just to try to put a, a thought in your brains, these are what I call the deadly bees. Do they have killer bees in Malaysia? These are the deadly bees. These can be as deadly to the spirit. Okay. The first form of a deadly bee message are what I call bee-like, bee-like messages, where we typically identify some person in Scripture and we say, follow this example. Be like this person. David was a man after God's own heart. He fought the, the lion and the bear, and in faith he beat up Goliath. You should be like David. Just don't read that chapter about Bathsheba. <laughs> or the murder of her husband. Or the bad children he raised. Or the pride with which he turned from God at the end of his life. Oh, well, be like Abraham instead. You know, Abraham was obedient to God. He went to the land he did not know. And on the way, he only gave away his wife twice. <laughs> Go, Abraham. I think the Bible takes care to tarnish almost every biblical figure. <laughs> so that we will not say, just be like so-and-so. And yet we're so prone to do it. Be like Barnabas. He was such an encourager to Paul. Why, his very name means encouragement. Just don't read about the second missionary journey at which he fought against Paul because he wanted John Mark to go along and Paul did not. Wouldn't it be wonderful if when our young people sometimes go off to university and uh, they face that professor who challenges them and says, you believe the Bible? You want to be like the people of the Bible? Did you ever actually read the Bible? Do you know what kind of a man Abraham was? Do you know what Jacob did? Do you know who Samson was and what he did? Wouldn't it be great if our young people could say, don't you know that's the point? <laughs> God rescues such messed up people. Isn't he a gracious God? Isn't he a wonderful God? that he could use such messed up people as that to bring him glory, that he could rescue and deliver people like that? If all we are saying to people is we point at some moral behavior, some good characteristics of some Bible characters, we are actually missing the point. Now, I'm not saying there aren't good things to learn from the biblical characters, but that's not the bottom line message. The bottom line is that God redeems a people who are undeserving of it. And he shows us over and over again how people must put their faith in him rather than in themselves. The reason the hall of heroes is in the book of Hebrews is because they are great people of faith. They must be. They're not great people of action. <laughs> right? Now, you're going to say, well, there's some biblical characters that seem to be almost totally good, and I will agree with that. I mean, it says of Enoch, remember? Enoch walked with God, and he was not. That's all it says, right? We haven't got any dirt we can get on him. That's all it says. <laughs> Enoch is an exception. The patriarchs were liars. The apostles were cowards. The judges were immoral. Gideon was an idolater. David was an adulterer. What's the point of all that? That even the angels would say, Behold the manifold wisdom of God that he could save people like that. There is a grace message throughout. And if all we are doing is we say, well, be like that person, we should take great care. Would David say, be like me? 
If David would not say it, we had better take great care to say it ourselves. What I wish you could do is put almost in, in bold letters and neon lights, kind of in that little gap there below where it says Daniel, Moses, Jesus, whatever, is you could put these words. God is the hero of every text. God is the hero of every text. Moses is not the hero. He claimed credit. He claimed credit at the end of his life, the end of his ministry, the Israelites, for what God himself had done. He struck the rock as though he could do it. Moses is not the hero. God is the hero. I will tell you that perhaps the most destructive thing we can do, rather than just pointing at good characters and be like him, maybe the most destructive thing we can do is we point at Jesus and say, well, just be like Jesus. Go ahead, it's easy. If you say to people, just be like Jesus, there's only one of two alternatives. They will say, I can't, and they will despair. Or they will say, I have. <laughs> In which case, their pride is their downfall. They're like the rich young ruler, right? Keep all the commandments. What did he say? I have, since I was a youth. In which case, he broke the first commandment. Remember? He's going down the road. Jesus is going down the road. Rich young ruler comes up to him and says, Good teacher, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, Why do you call me good? Only God is good. And what does the rich young ruler say about himself five seconds later? Me too. Only God is good. And when the rich young ruler said, I've kept all the commandments too, he broke the very first one. You shall have no other gods. Only God is good. If all we give people is be like this person, be a good person too, we've actually abandoned the message of Scripture in its totality. Very similar is the message be good. The second deadly be be good messages. Christianity in this form of message is simply de described as good moral behavior. We tell people to save themselves by being better than their neighbor or perhaps better than the church member next to them. Just hunker down and try harder. Boy Scouts are good, Girl Scouts are good, and Christians are good. It's good to be good. <laughs> it's bad to be bad. So be good. God love you for that. Actually, he won't love you for that. When we have done all we should do, said Jesus, Luke 17, 10, when we have done all that we should do, we are still unprofitable servants. Your behavior is not what gets you a seat at God's table. Your faith in what God has done for you, not what you do for yourself. Maybe easiest to our lips and hardest on our people is the last B message. Be disciplined. Be disciplined. This is some form of sanctify yourself message. Pray more. Read your Bible more. Go to church more. Especially go to my church more. <laughs> How much more will be enough? will never be enough. God is holy, and he requires total commitment. And if your standing with him depends upon your discipline, you will fail. And yet all around us, there are believers who think this, right? Listen to them. Oh, I knew it was going to be a terrible day. I had too short a quiet time. What did they just say? I wasn't disciplined enough to placate the ogre in the sky. So he got me because I wasn't disciplined enough. We'll need to talk about what the real role of the Christian disciplines are. And we'll do that tomorrow. But what most of our people think is that our disciplines are bargaining chips with God. I'll do more to pay him off so he won't hurt me. In which case we make God and Satan change places. 
There is another reason for the Christian disciplines than just paying God off. It's not indulgences. It's not penance. How many people think, okay, I'll read my Bible. I'll do this thing I hate to do so God will be happy with me. And so they do something they hate doing because they think they are going to appease the God in heaven. We've taught them because we teach them that God is somehow reacting to a degree of their discipline. We'll talk more, but a message that simply says be more disciplined will kill people because they cannot be disciplined enough for a God who is holy. B messages imply that we are able to change our own fallen condition. Our path to grace is made by us, is the implicit message. Listeners are left to assume our acceptance by God is determined by our actions. But such messages, stated or implied, make us no different than Unitarians or Buddhists or Hindus. Isn't that right? If our way to God is made by us, it makes us no different. I don't know if you know what the romper room, you have romper room in Malaysia? It's a children's program in which uh, in a secular media, children are taught to be do-bees and not don't-bees. And it's just a children's program telling you, you know, be a good kid. So often our sermons, that's all they say, be a good person. But the Bible is not romper room. It has a different message and one that is undergirding all of these that we have said. One of the reasons it's important to recognize that these deadly bees are insufficient is, remember, there is no merit in keeping God's commands. Now, that may be a surprise to many Christians. There is no merit in keeping God's commands. Now, is there blessing in keeping God's... If I am faithful to my spouse, is there blessing in that? Yes. Does God love me more because I'm faithful? The answer is no. There's no merit in keeping God's commands. Well, then the question, well, then why would you do it? I'll tell you why many Christians keep God's commands. One of two reasons. They serve God so the ogre in the sky will not hurt them. If the reason that you serve God is so that God will not hurt you, who are you really serving? Yourself. There's another reason lots of believers serve God. They serve God so they'll get more good stuff. Either in this life or the life to come. Bigger mansions up there, you know. (laughs) Listen, if the primary reason that you serve God is so that you'll get more good stuff, who are you really serving? Yourself. It's just sanctified selfishness. You actually cannot serve God until you come to the profound conviction that your best works merit you nothing. If your best works merit you nothing, why would you do it? Not because you love yourself, because you love God. That's what actually makes it service to God. I'm doing this for Him. His priorities exceed my own. Now, I'm not saying there's no benefit to us. I already said there is blessing to me in faithfulness. But the primary reason I am faithful to my spouse is not because it's good for me. It's because I am giving myself to my God. Because if I'm only doing it because it's good for me, there could well come a time in life where in a moment of weakness, I would say, it's going to be better for me not to be faithful. It can't be the priority of our motivations cannot be ourselves. The priorities of our motivation have to be thanksgiving to the God who has saved us through no merit of our own. We'll talk more about that as we go. Now, some of you should, I hope, I'm trying to avoid the hard questions that you'll ask me in the answer period. (laughs) Because what's now playing in your brain is this. Aren't there B messages in Scripture? Are there any B-like messages? Does the Apostle Paul ever say, Be like me, follow my example. Does Paul ever say, be like me, follow my example? Does Paul ever say that? At least five times. Now finish the verse. Follow my example as I follow Christ. It's got a redemptive context. That's all we're asking for. We're not saying tell people to be immoral. 
not telling people don't obey. We're saying make sure the motivation is in the right place. It's responding to the grace of God. It's not earning the grace of God. It's responding in thanksgiving. And therefore, I have to say, the sentence at the bottom of page 4, recognize B messages are not wrong in themselves. These aren't wrong in themselves. They are wrong messages what? By themselves. That's what makes it a non-Christian message. It's not non-Christian to say to somebody, be kind to your neighbor. It becomes non-Christian if that's all that you say, if that's the end of the message. Okay, So the, all these B messages are not wrong in themselves. They are wrong by themselves. Now, I can say that easily, but let me tell you. I teach this material. It is, it is my life's joy to teach this material. And sometimes I will tell you, I will preach a sermon, and even as I'm walking down from the pulpit, I'll go, what did I just do? I spent the last 35 minutes just telling people, be good. It's so easy. It is so, we get a Bible verse, and it says right there, be good. So I unfold all, it says, you be good. It says it right there in the Bible. And what I have neglected is the redemptive context. It's so easy to do, but it actually hurts people. And the obligation of Christian preachers and teachers is that if we hurt people, we are obligated to heal them. And we cannot heal them by simply turning them back on themselves. We must turn them to the one who is their redeemer. On page 5, therefore, these words. A challenge to holiness must be accompanied by a Christ focus, or it is only human-centered religion. A challenge to holiness must be accompanied by a Christ focus, or it is only human-centered religion. What we communicate with the best of motives to help change damaging behaviors and attitudes actually hurts others if Christ is absent. People cannot do what they're told to do apart from Him, causing them either to despair of hope or to pretend to be holy. If they despair of hope or pretend to be holy, you should recognize both of those are equally spiritually destructive, right? If they despair of hope or pretend to be holy, each of which is actually spiritually destructive. Thus, if you wound, if you wound, even unintentionally, you are obligated to heal. How do you do that? Lead all instruction to him who alone can provide holiness. You might think of it in terms of the Apostle Paul when he's actually at his most strident. Now think of that. In the Ephesians 6 chapter where he's telling us to fight Satan by putting on the full armor of God. I mean, you you cannot find an apostle being more forceful in his expression, right? You must put on the helmet of salvation. You put on the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But before he says any of that, what's the context? He says, be strong in the power of what? His might. I must tell you, I look back at my own preaching, and I think there were times, many times, I preached Ephesians 6, and I told people to be strong in the power of their might because I skipped the redemptive context, and I simply said, buck up, do better, fight hard. Now, you buck up and you fight hard is still in the message. But apart from Christ, you will fail. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Why do we need to make sure there's a Christ focus? Because apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Through Christ, we can do everything. I would, if you will, just almost fix in your mind wherever you minister. It may be a a church, it may be a classroom, it may be a counseling room. But if you will, kind of imagine yourself in the normal place of your ministry and imagine that you have spoken to the people of God what God's word requires of them. 
They've heard you. And now they are leaving. They're going out the door to do what you say must be done. In your mind's eye, with whom do they go? Who do they hold in their hand? As you say, you must go out and serve God. Who do they hold as they go out? Is it just me, myself, and I? We will go. Or do you send them out with the Savior? Because if you send them out with me, myself, and I, they go out into darkness. But if you send them out with the Savior, they go out to joy and peace. And one more thing, the joy of the Lord will be their strength. We need to talk about how this happens. How does the joy of the Lord pervade the Scriptures? So what God causes people to do, they are made able to do. We'll go there tomorrow. Today has been just to say, If the Word is the ministry of Christ to His people, how do we make sure that Christ is present in our messages and is not just the message acceptable in a synagogue or a mosque, but is uniquely true to the faith and therefore empowers God's people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Let me pray with us. Father, would you work in us? Some of these truths are... Familiar to some, they are unfamiliar to others. And yet what brought us all here was a desire to honor you. To have more and more outside the church, inside the church, live their lives empowered by Christ's very presence. Teach us how to help them. Give us more of an understanding of how the gospel pervades the whole of Scripture. So that when we preach, when we teach, when we counsel, when we parent, Jesus is our helper and the helper of those to whom we minister. Grant us, Father, we pray more of him as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.